Welcome back to Black Conservative TV. Now, we all know what happened with the Supreme Court with the landmark decision on Thursday to gut affirmative action has made it unlawful for colleges to take race into consideration as a specific factor in admissions. But what I want to do is I wanted to talk about what Joe Biden said and what the great thinker of this world, Thomas Sowell, said. So check out this video. This is a rogue court. This is not a normal. Show me what diversity looks like. This is what diversity looks like. Show me what diversity looks like. This is what diversity looks like. Show me what solidarity looks like. This is what solidarity looks like. What do we do? Stand up like that. Diversity is under attack. What do we do? Stand up like that. Today we are hosting a rally uh, where we are fighting for our rights for affirmative action and as well for visibility. It's absolutely electric. We are surprised by the, by the, by the outcome and the amount of people who came out to support us. Ho, ho! Edward Obama has got to go, hey, hey! Ho, ho! Affirmative action means to me hearing and seeing the stories of the unheard and hearing how those stories frame their college application process and has framed their life. And just as a few years ago in 2016, the court has affirmed and reaffirmed this view that colleges could use race not as a determinant factor for admission, but as one of the factors among many in deciding who to admit from a, quali from a qualified, already qualified pool of applicants. Today, the court once again walked away from decades of precedent and make, as the dissent has made clear. The dissent states in today's decision, quote, rolls back decades of precedent and momentous progress, end of quote. I agree with that statement from the dissent. From, from the dissent. <clears throat> the court has effectively ended affirmative action in college admissions. And I strongly, strongly disagree with the court's decision. Because affirmative action is so misunderstood, I want to be clear, make sure everybody's clear about what the law has been and what it has not been until today. Many people wrongly believe that affirmative action allows unqualified students, unqualified students to be admitted ahead of qualified students. This is not, this is not how college admissions work. Rather, colleges set out standards for admission and every student, every student has to meet those standards. Then and only then, after first meeting the qualifications required by the school, do colleges look at other factors in addition to their grades, such as race? The way it works in practice is this. Colleges first establish a qualified pool of candidates based on meeting certain grade, test scores, and other criteria. Then and only then, then and only then, it is from this pool of applicants, all of whom have already met the school standards, that the class is chosen after weighing a wide range of factors, among them being race. Was it who said, if the Negro cannot stand on his own legs, let him fall? Ronald Reagan, Newt Gingrich, Charles Murray? Not even close. It was Frederick Douglass. This was part of a speech in which Douglass also said, everybody has asked the question, what shall we do with the Negro? I have had but one answer from the beginning, do nothing with us. Your doing with us has already played the mischief with us. Do nothing with us. Frederick Douglass had achieved a deeper understanding in the 19th century than any of the black leaders of today. Those whites who feel a need to do something with blacks and for blacks have been some of the most dangerous friends of blacks. Academia is the home of many such friends, which is why there are not only double standards of admissions to colleges, but also in some places double standards in grading. The late David Reisman called it affirmative grading. A professor at one of California's state universities where black students are allowed to graduate on the basis of easier standards put it bluntly. We are just lying to these black students when we give them degrees. That lie is particularly deadly when the degree is a medical degree, authorizing someone to treat sick people or perform surgery on children. 
For years, Dr. Patrick Chavis was held up as a shining example of the success of affirmative action, for he was admitted to medical school as a result of minority preferences and went back to the black community to practice medicine. In fact, he was publicly praised by the Lawyers' Committee for Civil Rights just two weeks before his license was suspended after his patients died under conditions that brought the matter to the attention of the Medical Board of California. An administrative law judge referred to Chavis's inability to perform some of the most basic duties required of a physician. A year later, after a fuller investigation, his license was revoked. Those who had for years been using Chavis as a shining example of the success of affirmative action suddenly changed tactics and claimed that an isolated example of failure proved nothing. Sadly, Chavis was not an isolated example. When a professor at the Harvard Medical School declared publicly, back in the 1970s, that black students were being allowed to graduate from that institution without meeting the same standards as others, he was denounced as a racist for saying that it was cruel to allow trusting patients to pay for our irresponsibility, trusting black patients in many cases. Why do supposedly responsible people create such dangerous double standards? Some imagine that they are being friends to blacks by lowering the standards for them. Some don't think that blacks have what it takes to meet real standards and that colleges and universities will lose their diversity and perhaps federal money with it if they don't lower the standards in order to get an acceptable racial body count. My own experience as a teacher was that black students would meet higher standards if you refused to lower the standards for them. This was not the royal road to popularity, either with the students themselves or with the friends of blacks on the faculty and in the administration. But when the dust finally settled, the students met the standards. We have gotten so used to abysmal performances from black students, beginning and failing ghetto schools, that it is hard for some to believe that black students once did a lot better than they do today, at least in places and times with good schools. As far back as the First World War, black soldiers from New York, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Ohio scored higher on mental tests than white soldiers from Georgia, Arkansas, Kentucky, and Mississippi. During the 1940s, black students in Harlem schools had test scores very similar to those of white working-class students on the Lower East Side of New York. Sometimes the Harlem scores were a little higher or a little lower, but they were never miles behind, the way they are today in many ghetto schools. If blacks could do better back when their opportunities were worse, why can't today's ghetto students do better? Perhaps blacks have too many friends today. When Berkeley used verbal test score cutoffs to eliminate applicants in 1984 and 1986, minority students were exempted, but Asian American students were not. Many Asians were wiped out by the verbal cutoff scores because their strong suit tends to be math. At Harvard, the test scores of Asian American applicants were virtually the same as those of white applicants but the Asian Americans actually admitted had test scores substantially higher than those of whites who were admitted. In terms of test scores, Asians had to be better to get in. It is not just Asians and Jews who lose their minority status because of outstanding performance. Some financial aid programs have also passed over those blacks who score above a certain level, in favor of those blacks who did poorly, who really need help. They want people they can feel sorry for. Academic smoothies are never at a loss to explain away whatever they do. At MIT, for example, the director of admissions has responded to criticisms of large test score disparities among people admitted from different racial and sex backgrounds by downgrading the importance of test scores. Differences in test scores have only a modest correlation with later academic performance, he said. This familiar argument is clever, but phony. The average MIT student scores in the top 1% in math. Just where in that top 1% probably doesn't matter a lot, as the Director of Admissions says, but it does matter that he is in the top 1%. By the same token, 
The difference of a few million dollars between one Rockefeller and another probably doesn't matter that much, but that doesn't mean that it makes no difference how much money you have. It makes a very real difference that 90% of the white MIT students score higher in math than the average black MIT student. A substantially higher percentage of the black students fail to finish MIT, and those who do graduate have substantially lower grade point averages. The tragedy is that this waste, more than one-fourth of the black students don't graduate at MIT, is completely unnecessary. The average black student at MIT is well above the national average on math tests. He is just not in the stratospheric level of other MIT students. At most colleges, universities, or technical institutes, these same black students would be on the dean's list. In short, black students with every prospect of success are artificially turned into failures by being mismatched with their college. This is not peculiar to MIT. It is a nationwide phenomenon among elite schools who are more interested in having a good-looking body count from every group than they are in the price that has to be paid. Everyone pays a very high price for this academic fad. Disadvantaged minority students pay the highest price of all. Asians may be lucky that they are not considered a minority.